Romans chapter 5. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 18. Romans chapter 5 verse 18. It says, Therefore, as by the offenses of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the, by righteous, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. What did it call salvation? Free A free gift unto justification in life. Same book, chapter 3 and verse 24. Romans 3, 24. Let's see this again. Being justified, how, friends? Freely. Freely. By His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Is salvation a free gift, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. It is something that God is giving the most priceless thing, and yet He gives it free. Incredible. The Bible plainly declares that. Yet on the other hand, we have some Bible verses that seem to say the exact opposite, don't we? Let's go to Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 26. Familiar story. Jesus said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whomsoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and count the what? Count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. So now Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God to these several things. And he says in the King James, if you don't hate your father, brother, sister, mother more than me, which means love less. If you, don't, if you, if you love them more than me, you can't be my disciple. You can't follow me. You're following them, not me. And he says, yeah, if you don't take up your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple either. And he says, you know what? So think about this. Eternal life is wonderful. It's worth it. But if you're serious about this, you need to sit down and count the what? Wow. Count the costs. So on one hand, we have Jesus saying, listen, it's a free gift. On the other hand, he says, count the cost. Is this a dichotomy in scripture? There's a very good answer. What about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? Remember the rich young ruler? Almost became the 13th disciple, if you will. He could have been. And Jesus said, yeah, you could follow me. But was there a cost for him? Do you remember, what did he say to him? Go sell all you have. Come follow me. The cost was too high for him. But there was a cost for the rich young ruler. And Jesus says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whomsoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16, 25. And we could go on. But we have these scriptures that seem to indicate there's a cost, quite high cost. And then on the other hand, we have Bible verses saying it's a free gift. Is the Bible contradicting itself? How do we explain this? And so, you know, a lot of people would resent this. Maybe you have gotten into a business deal like this where something was offered free up front. You say, oh, great, this is free. It's free for those who have a subscription. Well, what's a subscription? That's 100 bucks a month. But it's free, yeah, for those who have a subscription. Well, how much is a subscription? $100 a month. It's like God, it's, it's God is offering us something free on the front end and then charges us on the back end. And it, it seems to be uh, like a bad business deal. But is this how God works? No, there's a good answer for this. How do we reconcile this? How do we, make a, how do we uh, reconcile these two concepts we see in Scripture? Friends, it's all about definitions. And we're going to define two very, very important things. Number one, what does free mean? What does that mean, free? And also, what is salvation? What is that? Let's start with the first question. What does free mean? And what we want to understand is, does free mean no effort? Let's think about this. We're having a pretty good winter, but let's say the... California water crisis gets really bad. You know what? We've been in a drought. Let's say it just gets like 10 times worse and there's hardly any drinking water. And the Safeway down the street here in South Lake Tahoe puts an ad in the paper and it says free bottled water. 
you're like, wow, free bottled water. We hardly have anything coming out of the tap, and it's free. The moment you read that ad, does a bottle of water just appear on your hand? It doesn't work that way. It's free, right? But what needs to happen in order for you to get that water? Got to go to Safeway. You got to get your wallet. Well, no, you could actually leave that because it's free, right? Yeah. Get your car keys. Open your car. Get in your car. You got to drive there. You probably got to press through the crowds because a lot of people are going to be there. You got to look for the free gift, right? You got to find it. You have to acquire it. Go to the cash register. Yep, that's free. You could go. And then when you get home, you have to open it and take it in in order to absorb its benefits. Was it free? Did it take no effort? No. See, that's the implication is when something's free, it means no effort. That's not necessarily true. Something can be entirely free and yet take effort to obtain. Another example of that is exercise, fresh air. Those things are free, but do they take effort? Yeah, you have to work to breathe. You have to work to get exercise. And so free, what free means is whatever normal currency is exchanged for an item is not being asked for. That's what free means. It doesn't mean no effort. It just means whatever the normal currency is that's being asked for that is not being asked for that item. And so when we are talking about salvation, what's the currency? Friends, what is the cost to get into heaven? What's the price tag? You know, um, a good question to ask is, why are, do angels have eternal life? Mm -hmm. The angels have eternal life. Why do they get that? They have never sinned. They render perfect obedience. Do you know what the price tag is on salvation? Do you know what the entrance cost is to get through the pearly gates? Perfect obedience. Those people are safe to inhabit heaven. So I have a question for you this morning. Do you have the funds to pay for that price tag? You don't have it, right? But did someone pay that for you? Absolutely. Let's confirm this in scripture. Go to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 8. Blessed are they which are what? <clears throat> Pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, first thing, who gets to see God? Those who have a pure heart. Can you have a pure heart in sin? No. no. Sin comes from impurity. Also, verse uh, 48, same, same chapter, Matthew 5, verse 48. Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be ye therefore, what friends? Perfect. perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What's the price tag for heaven? Perfection, perfection friends. Perfect obedience. Revelation twenty two fourteen says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life. Also, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see who? The Lord. The Lord. Friends, we could go on and on. The Bible's clear. Perfect holiness is what it takes to see God. And these are tough pills to swallow. And as tough as it sounds, it's Bible teaching that it takes perfect holiness to see God. Well, then what you're thinking, what I'm thinking is, great, I'm already done. I, that, that ended for me a few minutes after I had the ability to start sinning. I did. So if a 100% spotless character is what it takes to get into heaven, and even just one sin, one small sin is enough to keep us out, what hope is there for us? We're going to look into that. But friends, it's, it's important to understand this because we have to realize sometimes when we go on years and years in the Christian life, we just feel entitled to heaven. Listen, you have no business in heaven. Amen? When you realize it's perfect holiness that gets into heaven, you realize, I'm so blessed that God would let me get in that place. I so don't deserve being in that place. Perfect holiness gets into heaven. I'm far from that. But Christ, we're going to talk about this in the, here in a minute. Christ has done something to make sure that someone like me could get into heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. 
But <clears throat> some people might be thinking, really, is the bar that high even just one sin? That's enough? I mean, if you had met someone that committed just one sin, you'd be like, oh, you know, like, wow, only one? That's like one a day for me, right? You know, like, whoa, someone just committed one sin? How could you say that that person's even bad? But let's think about this. Imagine someone standing before a judge, someone who actually committed the crime of murder. And the judge says, well, we're here to uh, talk about the murder you committed on such and such date. That man could say, judge, but listen, I think this is kind of an overreaction. There was one day I murdered this year. There were 364 days I didn't murder nobody. No murders. And we're just going to talk about that one. The judgment isn't to talk about the 364 days that no murder happened. The judgment's to talk about that one day that murder did happen. That's not how it works in court. If there's a stain, there's a stain. And think about it. Even if right now you became the holiest person on earth and you stopped sinning, you just never sinned from here on forward, would it be good enough? The answer is no. Because you have a record already in the past. And friends, one spot, one stain, boom, out of heaven. That's it. And so there is a cost of salvation. There's a price tag. It's perfect obedience. And really that implies a perfect heart, a heart that is perfectly in line with God. And no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to say yes to God. I choose him. I choose him entirely. I choose him eternally. Do you have that payment? You don't have it. I don't have it. But did Jesus pay that currency for us? He did. Jesus, did he live a perfect life? Does he have that currency? Mm -hmm. He did it. He did it. He lived perfect life as God, but also as a man. And he's able to take that perfect human record and put it on top of your faulty, sinful record. Isn't that incredible? When we know that there's no pearly gates scene that we often see, you know, in the comics, you know, or where Peter's standing at some desk. But for the lack of a, uh, for the sake of illustration, imagine there were. And there was a, you know, we know there are books with records and the angel's looking over the books and he's looking over your life. Yikes, what could he see? What would the angel see? Instead of seeing your lies, he would see Christ's honesty. Instead of seeing your anger, he would see Christ's meekness. Instead of seeing your pride, he would see Christ's humility. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. You get to go enjoy paradise, which is a place only for people who've rendered perfect obedience to God. You get to go. And you know what that act does? That act's called justification. It transforms the heart to start rendering the very thing needed for heaven, perfect obedience. That's possible. The Bible, we... We're studying about uh, that in Sabbath school, book of Revelation. There's going to be a group of people who get victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, standing on the sea of glass. Probation's closed. There's no mediator in the sanctuary. No more ability to send sins up to the sanctuary. There's no one there to mediate for it. There's no blood. They don't need one. That's, That's what we find in Scripture. It's incredible. So is salvation a free gift? Yes. But does that mean there's no effort needed to obtain it? No. Because there are some things that are free that take effort to obtain. Let me just address the question. Does this mean that we are working for our salvation? No, it doesn't. Now imagine that. Let's go back to that grocery store illustration. Imagine there's no water. You show up to the grocery store. You've gotten in your car. You've driven all the way there. You found the aisle. Could the manager say, after all of your effort, oh, that sale ended five seconds ago. Now it's $2,000 a bottle. Could the manager do that? Does he have the authority to do that? The Safeway supervisor, the manager can do that. It's his product. He could sell it for how much or how little he wants to. And so despite all your effort, you could get to that grocery store. He could end the sale and charge you as much as he wants. It's up to him. And so all the effort could mean nothing. But without that effort, you'd never be at the grocery store in the first place if the sale was still going. Let me tell you, friends, the sale is going on for salvation right now. It's still free. And it will take great effort to obtain it and effort to keep it, but it will always be free. And you will not be required to pay the currency yourself, which is a perfect record, because you don't have that. You couldn't pay it. And Christ has supplied that for you. 
And we don't have the perfect heart either, but he gives us that as we receive that free gift. It transforms us. And so we could start actually creating through his grace our own perfect record. That's what the Bible teaches. It's the only way we're going to have a group of people who could live on earth without a mediator in the sanctuary. And that's what the book of Revelation teaches, friends. This is actually the Seventh day Adventist gospel. You know, I like that gospel because it has a lot of power in it, friends. You know, there's a lot of different gospels out there. Some gospels say, you know what? Sin, repent, keep getting up. That's the way it's going to be till the second coming. Did you know that's not the Adventist gospel? The Adventist gospel says, sin, repent, get up until God's grace has finished its work in you and you're not doing it anymore. That's the Adventist gospel. His grace is sufficient. There's a lot of power. It's actually double grace. <laughs> Adventists are so uh, accused of being legalists. We actually believe in double grace, friends. Anyhow, what is salvation? Let's get to that second question. What's salvation? Is this a collectible item that you could put you know, on your trinket shelf next to many other items? Is it a gift that you stow away in a garage like a new car? Is it, is it a thing or is it a legal act in a book somewhere? What is salvation? Let's let the Bible answer that question. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. John 17 and verse 3. I don't hear any pages turning. I assume you're there. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So what is salvation? It's to know God. It's not a thing. It's a relationship. Salvation is a relationship. That is life eternal. And what does it mean to know God? Let's go to the book of Nahum, a book we don't go to very often, one of the minor prophets. Nahum, I'll give you a little extra time to find this one. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. Okay, you guys are pretty good. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that do what? That trust in him. So when it's talking about to know God, it's really talking about doing what? Trusting God. Knowing God is, is equivalent to trusting Him. And that is how we gain an experience with God. So friends, salvation is a relationship, and it's a relationship in which you relate to God by entirely depending on Him and trusting Him. You trust Him. You trust that guy. You trust God because He's proven Himself in your life over and over and over. And so it's a, it's a relationship. It's not a what. It's a who. Salvation happens when someone makes the decision to put God number one in their heart. Number one. Not two, not 1.5, number one. And when something is number one, everything else is subservient to it. Everything comes under. Everything's subservient to it. So salvation is choosing a master. And according to the Bible, how many full-time masters can you serve? Only one, friends. You can only do that once. You know, back in the ancient days, um, there were slaves that would live with their owners, especially in the Roman world. And that was a full-time job. From the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed, you served that master. How many of those kind of jobs can you have? Only one, friends. Only one 17-hour-a-day job you could have. Salvation is choosing a master. Salvation is choosing a way of life. How many different ways of life can you live? Just one, friends. There's the only way of life you can live. I uh, have a really good illustration that I use to illustrate this. And, um, but I don't have the prop that I normally use to illustrate it. So I'm going to just tell you what it is. But it's, it's, I wish you could see it because it's a really good illustration. Do you guys know those gym balls, those really big, huge gym balls that you see you do crunches on and stuff like that? Have you ever picked up one of those, like the large version? Fills your whole arms, right? So I usually I invite a volunteer to come up here, and I usually bring one of those gym balls. We don't have access to one right now. And I ask someone to hold that. And I say, this is your life. It, this gym ball resembles your life. It's all your thoughts. All your aspirations, everything you do, who you are, your friends, your family, your relationships, it 
is your life. And then I pull out another one. And I say, this gym ball is eternal life. The second one I've pulled out. It's free. You can have it. Here, take it. Can you imagine someone holding a gym ball? Are they able to hold the second one? That's a really good illustration. I wish I could show it to you, but I think you're, you're imagining it. How many of those can you hold at once? One. Only one. And so to hold that second gym ball, which resembles God's life, eternal life, heaven, salvation, what do they have to do with the first gym ball? They have to put it down. It's free, but in order to take it, they have to put the other one down. There's only one life you can live. You can't live two lives, friends. One life, one master. And that's what salvation is. It's absolutely free, but it takes everything because we have to put down our own life. And we have, in order to accept God's life. You can't hold two at the same time. And salvation is a free gift, but I think it's actually more accurately described as an exchange. It's an exchange of things. Whatever master you served before, you put that down and you serve a new master. Whatever life you lived before, you put that down and you live a new life. And whenever I see people make this decision, they put down their life, what their will, their desires, and they take God's, that's when I see conversion happen. Working as an evangelist, I get to see something incredible. I get to see people change, transform right in front of my eyes. It is supernatural. When you see someone who starts coming to meetings and they're dark, or they start coming to Bible studies and you know, they, they, they look like they don't wanna be there and you just see the stain of guilt and a, and a messed up past coming through their countenance. And as they hear the word, hear the word, hear the word, they start changing. And all of a sudden you see light, hope, joy being expressed in this person's face. They start talking about God. They start, you know, feeling like, I feel like I know him now. They start saying things like this. Whew, it's incredible. It's amazing. We had the privilege of studying with a young man who was uh, in this kind of a situation. He was coming to the Bible studies and he was coming with a girlfriend of his whom, uh, let's just say, he was not equally yoked with. And she was constantly bringing him down, spiritually speaking. And he was there, but he just, it's like someone plugged a little hose in him and sucked the life out of him. Have you ever seen someone like that? Just like, just, just there, like life was this galling yoke, this ball and chain. And, but he was coming, he was coming to the studies. And he stopped coming after a while. He actually transitioned to a different study, so that was good. We didn't see him for about a year. Then uh, one day, he actually came to our workplace, and we saw him. He didn't even have to speak. I could tell from the look on his face, something had changed. We're like, what's up? What happened? And he went on to tell us that the dynamics in his relationship got really tough, and it came to a culminating point where he literally had to choose God or my girlfriend. It was a showdown. He chose God. <laughs> he chose the Lord. Let me tell you, for, me, for a young person, that's hard to do. That, that's a young person's version of giving everything, giving your dating choices, giving your relationships to God. That's, for the adults, maybe it would be giving your career or you know, your family. For the young person, it's who I'm dating. And he just went on to tell us that from that point onward, the spirit, the spirit filled him, and he was a converted person. He ended up going to a Bible training school and working as a Bible worker and getting involved in ministry. It was just wonderful to see this young man just blossom. And over and over and over, I see in people's lives, what's the changing point? Everything else is God drawing, God drawing, God drawing, all the Bible studies, all the prayers, all the friendship evangelism. What's the deciding point? I give it all to God. I put my ball down. I take his. Boom. Boom that person gets filled with the Spirit. You see the change in their life. It's exactly what happened with me. I went through this, Jennifer went through the same. It doesn't always have to be a relationship, but something, some idol, something that's sitting in your heart where God ought to be. And God is addressing it and saying, do you want me or do you want that? It's different for every person. And so when we completely accept that free gift, put down our ball, take God's, a transformation happens. And it's free, but yet also 
it costs us everything. You know, friends, I share this because, well, I'll, I'll get to that. There's a very good reason I share this, but I want to read one Bible verse before I do. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. It's our scripture reading, actually, Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Could we read that together? I'm going to be reading the King James. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So Jesus is likening the kingdom of heaven to a big, beautiful, expensive pearl. And when this man, this merchant man, found this pearl, it was so incredible, it had so much value, he sold how much? Everything to go buy that pearl. Because he recognized that pearl is like a hundred times more valuable than all my current possessions. It would be foolish of me to not sell everything to get that pearl. And you know, sometimes when you make that decision, the people around you might not understand. Imagine if there was a vacant field over here and you learned somehow that there was a huge treasure chest. This is the stuff kids dream about, right? A huge treasure chest just five feet under the ground in that property. And people saw you sell your car. They saw you sell your house. They saw you sell every article of clothing you had. You had to you know, wear one of those barrels. Remember the cartoons, old cartoons, they'd have a barrel on with like, you know, suspenders. You're out there, you have no earthly possession and you got a shovel and you're digging in this field that you bought. What are people gonna think about you? That guy's nuts. He is absolutely crazy. And then you get to that treasure and you 10X everything you had before. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Have you received that free gift, friends? Is Jesus your pearl of great price? Have you found in Jesus something that is worth giving up literally everything in this world for? The apostle Paul said, I count all things but loss that I might obtain Christ. Have you found that in Jesus? If there's, if there's a struggle in your heart, if you're not sure, might I suggest not because Christ is not that valuable, but it's because Satan has blinded our eyes to make him appear not that valuable to us. He is that valuable. He is something that is worth selling everything for. Let me tell you, when I made that decision for myself, it's when I realized God's love for me was unconditional. I was used to so much conditional love, especially in my dating relationships. It was just all because you make me feel good, I make you feel good. I like what you do for me, I like what you like what I do for you. And you know, when, when that burns you, when, when somehow you don't match up, when you don't meet the expectations, you get kicked out the back door, and then you experience God's love. When you're at your lowest, when you have nothing to offer God, when you are a nobody sitting on the curb, and God says, I paid everything for you. You say, oh, where have you been my whole life? I'm sold. I'm sold. I will take you. And that, when that experience happened to me, I said, God, uh, I tried it my way. I experienced all the conditional love that the world has to offer. I've never found anything like what you're offering me. You got it, man. You got it. I am with you to the end. I have not found anything like this, not from my parents, not from my ex-girlfriends, not from my friends at college, not from teachers, not from nobody. No one has what you have. When you found that, when you found something in Jesus that the world cannot latch a, let, might a, light a match to, friends, you'll sell everything you have. Everything will come subservient. Everything will be second. Jesus will be first, and people will see it in your life. They, some people might think you're crazy, like the guy with the barrel, with the shovel in the field. You might look crazy to some people. Why would they do that? Why would they live that way? Why would he give up a good career? Why would they, you know, make those decisions? That seems so limiting because they don't understand the treasure that you found. They don't get it. Does Jesus mean everything to you? Is he your pearl of great price? You know, friends, as we sleep comfortably in our beds at night, let's remember that there were times where Jesus had nowhere to lay his head for us. The foxes have holes, the birds have nests. The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Let's remember that as we eat our delicious food, Jesus had to fast for 40 days so you could overcome appetite. Let's remember that as we enjoy our friends, Jesus was hated by the world. He could not truly be understood by anybody. 
Nobody could identify with him, even his disciples. Let's remember that as we drink water, that Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, I thirst, I'm thirsty for you, friends. Let's remember as we pray to God, any time of the day you want, openly and freely, just communicate with him, that Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he said, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you? Where are you? I can't feel you. For you, friends, he did that for you. Have you found in Jesus a friend more precious, so precious worth forsaking everything in this world for? I have. Have you? Jesus said, count the cost. It wasn't money, but it was your life. It was your way. Why do I share this? Friends, because we have a problem in the church. The church is full of people with the superficial profession. I'm not saying this point fingers at anyone, but I'm saying that's the truth. We're told that clearly in the testimonies, and we see it clearly in the issues that we're dealing with in the church. And soon, possibly very soon, friends, it will literally cost you everything to walk with Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's true. We were studying about it this morning. It'll cost your bank account. It'll cost you a stable home. It'll cost you the assurance of knowing where your next meal is coming from. It's going to cost you friends. It's going to cost you family if it hasn't already. And we need to check ourselves, friends, before the crisis comes to know, have I found a friend in Jesus so precious? Have I found something so valuable for him that I actually count those things? Paul used the word dung. Loss. It's garbage. It's garbage compared to what I have in Jesus. Have you found that in Christ? Now's the time to do it before the crisis hits because the time is soon coming where it will cost you everything to walk with Jesus step by step. Is there anything in this world that you're still clinging to that you know is not of God? Anything you watch? Anything you listen to? Anything you still say? Anything you still participate in? Something you're not willing to give up. We're going to close with a word of prayer, and I'm going to have a special prayer. We're going to have a silent time of prayer. And as we have a word of silent prayer between you and God, you know the answer. Actually, God is the one who truly knows the answer, and you probably know it too. Ask him to reveal to you, is there anything between me and you, Lord? Anything that I have not surrendered to you? Have I not laid down my life? Is there something that's keeping me, that's preventing me, that's holding me back from taking that great gift of salvation. That's free, but has the cost of laying down my own life, of putting down my ways. As we have a moment of silent prayer, ask God, is there anything between you and me? We'll have about 30 seconds of silent prayer, and then I'll end with the closing prayer. Can we please kneel together?